Support for Rouge Radio is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0. I'm one of the first people to try the new 4.0, and I'm blown away by the performance, the craftsmanship, and details on the 4.0 are next level. I got to tell you, we've all been there. The fact we use generic blades down there and you don't really want to go too further because you're just not completely confident. With the 4.0, confidence is not even an issue. The Lawnmower 4.0 even allows you to customize your trim through an additional guard length with sizes 1 to 4. It's time to get your own ball hair and body trimmer with Manscaped to make me time the best time and enhance your confidence with some nice, smooth boys. Get 20% off free shipping with the code ROUGE at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. It's time to get the point, as ROUGE Radio is ready to kick off. Ready! The best football talk with the best in the business. So what is the cost? You have two first-round picks this year because they are going to dumb enough to trade for Drew Willie. A few rookies. We go directly to the on-field product. We welcome to the show the 20th overall pick in this past Sunday's CFL draft, DeAndre Wright of the Alouettes. DeAndre, welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. And the occasional Hall of Famer. Please welcome Doug Brown, who is one of the members of the current class of 2016 in the CFL Hall of Fame. Doug, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you, guys, for the kind of words and for having me on the program. Rouge Radio is on the air. Here's your hosts, Robert Dalton and Tony Allen. Well, we definitely found out if one particular bumblebee could fly. And if you paid attention to last week's show, you can get that reference. It's the Rouge Radio Podcast, episode 426, powered by the Canadian Football Podcast Network. My name is Robert Dalton, and joining me is Tony. I love it when Hawkeye LARPs Allen. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, that's a little a little sly reference to the new Disney Plus series, Hawkeye. Uh, first off, uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing absolutely great. I had a few days off of work to rest and recoup. I'm back in Lethbridge at my second home now, the Econo Lodge. A free plug for Econo Lodge, I guess. But no, good day overall. Great day for football. Watching Hawkeye. The first three episodes, it's been a lot of fun. It's no, it's not Loki or WandaVision, but it's up there. It's definitely not as bad as the Falcon and Winter Soldier was. So a uh, good start for Hawkeye. Yes, the the episode with LARPing was, was definitely my favorite so far. <laughs> you didn't like the, the, the Falcon and the, or the Winter Soldier? Or well, whatever, that was garbage. Uh, no? Absolute garbage. That, that, <laughs> that show, again, just quickly... That show had no idea what it wanted to be, where it was going. Like, literally, there's you do not even have to watch that show in order because it makes no sense. Nothing <laughs> flows. None of the episodes are related. And it's just, it was absolute garbage. It had a great message when, you, when the final episode played and you saw they were talking about, okay, so you had a message. It was just absolute horrible execution to get to that message so no falcon and winter soldier is a zero zero star zero zero captain america shields out of five captain america shields it was it was horrible uh you you know the uh you know we we usually get email and i guarantee someone's going to chime in not about our cfl takes but the fact that tony does not like any episode of the uh the falcon and the winter soldier Uh, um garbage (laughs) <laughs> hey, speaking of your uh, your hotel, do you any 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 uh, you know any way that we can get like a special sponsor with the hotel? I mean, you've been well, you've I'll been there first. <laughs> At least a uh, month now, I would say. So I'm yeah, close to a month. So yeah, instead we'll of see. TSN, instead of TSN, they should actually provide a channel that just you know twenty four seven the Rouge Radio podcast. That's there it. you go. <laughs> they can um, they can be they can house us at the Grey Cup. We got it for next year. We'll have to get a Connell Lodge on board, and they can put you and I up in our own rooms for the Grey Cup. We're on. We'll drive hunt. the we'll drive the Regina <laughs> from <laughs> yeah from from that hotel. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if you want to go directly into the games or the big news. I, we'll, we'll talk about the big. We'll talk about the news at hand that started over this past week as uh, we talk about our three down hot takes. And uh, this is sponsored by cgiant.ca. Enter the promo code ROUGE for discounts on sporting events 
in your area. And uh, the first one made a huge amount of news in the CFL last week, and approximately Friday morning, McLeod Bethel Thompson was filmed at a Raptors game doing some uh, some cross promotion with uh, other MLS MLSE uh, sponsor teams and uh, getting uh, getting everything all uh, all hyped up for the Eastern final that happened earlier today, and he was sent home in uh, due to COVID protocols. So. Here's the thing that happened. All right, so Michael, uh, so the, the end of the end of everything here is that he was allowed to play pending negative tests, which he did. And uh, after today's showing, he might have he might have well have missed the game anyway. Um, but more on that later. But your opinion on this one, because it just seems that uh, if the, if the league has this league wide week one to end of season rule. It does it not seem that they bent over backwards for the Toronto Argonauts, which is not a very good look when you kind of, you know, favor one team out of nine? Yeah, no, I don't think it has any resemblance at all of favoritism towards the Toronto Argonauts in this situation. I think this is a completely different series of events that, in comparison to the beginning of the season, are completely different and needed a different approach to it. We're not talking about the Edmonton Elks at the beginning of the season who were, you know, just flaunting COVID protocols. We're talking about players who are anti-mask, anti-vaxxers, and, you know, are trying to make a statement or get on a soapbox and be anti-events because, you know, we're all having our freedoms taken away. This was just a guy who was asked to go to, go to a game on behalf of the organization, do a Raptors game, try and get some more butts in the seats. And, you know what, maybe it was... Even if it was poor decision on him, it, it falls on the Toronto Argonauts organization. But here's a situation where you don't say, listen, here's one rule, uh, and because we did it to the Elks, we need to do it to you because the Elks was a certain set of situations. These were players that just did not care about following COVID protocols. I don't think you could say that McLeod Bethel Thompson openly disrespects COVID protocols. He just went doing what he was asked to do. Uh, also, you're looking at uh, the scope of the events that are happening. When the day started, I won't name the CFL reporter who made the comments because it's not important, but usually those things do reflect the media as a whole. The day started with an outrage that because of CFL protocol, it was idiotic that the Canadian Football League is going to have to sit McLeod Bethel Thompson going into its second biggest weekend of the year. And then by the time it got out that the CFL was like, you're right, we need to take action, but to make a miss the East final is stupid. So no, we're, we're not going to jeopardize his chance to play in the biggest game of the year so far, but we still need to take action. There was no favoritism put, but it was good business. That's what you're supposed to do. We're not talking about regular season games. Bethel McLeod, McLeod Bethel Thompson isn't going to be gallivanting across the country, hitting different stadiums over the course of certain days and interacting in different cities in different teams. He's got a, he's, he's coming off a bye week. This guy hasn't been, for all we know, maybe it is, he has been gallivanting all over North America. But <laughs> for all intents and purposes, he's been in Toronto for two weeks practicing. So it's, it, it's a different set of circumstances, and it, it's not that black and white. Yes, the rules are in place, and yes, the Canadian Pro League probably should have altered those rules as the season went along, as vaccine mandates came into place, as COVID numbers started to drop. And in this situation, the CFL had to amend its rule to do its best for the league. So when the, we woke up in the morning and it was the media calling the CFL a clown league for making one of its star quarterbacks sit out going into the East Final – finding out they were going to do what we all wanted, and then it turned into calling the Canadian football a clown league because they weren't staying rock hard to one set of rules that should blanket everyone with absolutely no thought to it whatsoever. And what we even made it even more hilarious is that we were coming off the National Football League, who has Brett Favre lying about everything and getting fined. Well, and then uh, Aaron Rodgers. Sorry, Aaron Rodgers lying. Yeah. And getting a fine. Another player lying about the same protocols 
and getting suspended three games. My, I do not remember any of my social medias being flooded with the National Football League being an absolute joke and a clown league because of it. But now we are hanging the Canadian Football League publicly for doing what was in the best interest of the league. So, no, there was no favoritism to the Toronto Argonauts. If that had been Jeremiah Mazzoli, I think the Canadian Football League would have done the exact same thing and said, listen, we're not going to make this guy sit out of one of our marquee football games. And they would have absolutely made him have negative tests, show those results, and prove that he is not infected with COVID-19. I think the whole thing is not a reflection of the Canadian Football League. It is a reflection of this country's addiction to making anything the Canadian football. And, and a follow-up on that is that day, there is, uh, I, I'll, I'll freely name this reporter, Arash Madani, goes on the mm. sports cage in Regina. And without saying it, he said, mentioned references that Jeremiah Mazzoli is not vaxxed. He doesn't have his two shots. So with that being said, now we've got, okay, we've got rules for, you know, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders who are traveling from one province to another. Now they have some unvaccinated players that they can't, they, they can't bring one. I mean, I'm not shedding a tear for them, but they're following the rules. Whereas now, because you've got Toronto, Hamilton within the same province, travel isn't that big of a deal. It just seems that the Eastern Division has kind of benefited from this loophole in regards to unvaccinated. And I, I, I know that this kind of caught you off guard with this kind of, but you mentioned Jeremiah Mazzoli. I just kind of had to bring it up. So, I mean, is it, if, if Hamilton, and we'll talk more about the Tiger Cats later in the program, if the Tiger Cats do happen to win the Grey Cup, will there be an asterisk because of their lack of travel options? In, in Hamilton because they're, now they're going to be at home and you know they can have as many unvaccinated players as they can because their travel options just aren't what they're what what was going to be appealing to what you know in this case the Winnipeg Blue Bombers or had the, you know the, the different result the Saskatchewan Rough Riders so I mean that does provide a uh, kind of a little bit of a disadvantage does it not well, I mean, you're I mean, you're also talking about every you're talking about different provinces as well. Like the, the yeah. eastern teams stay within their province, and different provinces have different travel protocols as well. And I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with the Canadian Football League. Uh, but here, here's the thing. Here, here's the thing. There, there should have been like I, I get the whole okay. We need to have everybody double vax, or if you're not, then you don't play, right? It's like uh, it's their own little vac, you know, their vaccine mandate. But I think there should have been a little bit of a, hey, listen, Hamilton, you are traveling to Toronto. You are, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it just, it just, yeah, I, I get it. The the public health orders in Ontario are a little bit different than they are in Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, Manitoba, or uh, otherwise. It's just that when we're dealing with a, pro, uh, with a, with a league that spans over six provinces, there has to be something that, that falls in line for equality, right? I mean, I just see, it just seems now in this case, I don't really think it really affects the Winnipeg Blue Bombers because I think they are 99.9, .9, even close to 100% double vax anyway. Uh, but if you're a Toronto Argonaut fan, I mean, this kind of gives you, I mean, I, I, at this point, I just think that the optics are just more, are more like how providing. Does, how, does, how does Mazzoli not being vaccinated help the Hamilton Tiger Cats? Well, today it didn't help them at all. <laughs> yeah, I, well, that's the thing. It's like, I mean, I get we're we're, we're finding reasons to find problems. We, mm -hmm. We're finding problems to all of our solutions. The Canadian Football League has solutions, and we're finding problems. And the deal, and the thing is, not every solution needs a problem. And that's what we do. We're, we're finding the problems with the CFL's COVID protocols. We are finding problems with how teams have carried themselves during those protocols. We, we will find a problem with every solution the CFL has come up with at this point to make sure the 2001 season is started. And no matter what solutions the CFL comes up with, we will find a problem for them because every solution needs a problem when it comes to the Canadian Football League. 
and, and uh, we could probably just run circles. Yeah, we could run circles on this all day. But no matter what the CFL does, like we said, the only hypocrisy yesterday was starting the morning being outraged that the Canadian Football League, with their policy, was going to have to suspend McLeod Bethel Thompson for the East Final until they didn't. So then we were pissed off that they did what we wanted and did what was right, and we can't allow that. So we were outraged that they didn't have a hard line on suspending McLeod Bethel Thompson for the East Final. Again, it didn't matter at the end of the day because Dane Evans was the hero. But still, we, we, the only hypocrisy yesterday was Canadians and Canadian media. To me, that was it. And there we go. They're the only awesome. ones who look like a clown. <laughs> Anyways, Here. keep going. Uh, second hot take, and uh, this this kind of uh, I, I think it built into its own based on uh, a play that happened in the Western Final. Uh, you kind of made reference to it on your Twitter account. Uh, there was a college football game with a quarterback that pretended to fake slide, and instead of fake sliding, because he fake slide, uh, he ended up running uh, running down for I don't know was a forty yard touchdown scamper. Yeah. Yeah. And you could see the play. You could see the defensive players quit on the play. Yeah, and so I mean, how do like to, to transpose this? Because I and I think you're referring to the oh, I can't remember the player, but it was Cody Fajardo who went ahead and slide uh, slid. I kind of missed this play, but there was there was some chitter chatter. So the end of the day, should we not have hook slides or should we outright ban fake slides? I mean, like fake slides are bad enough because I, to be honest, that, that, that video you posted was kind of like, okay, that was kind of, all right. The, Greasy the defense, as fuck. It, it was, it was. But at the same time, I, I don't think that we would actually see that something like that. Because it was, it, oh man, I have to take a look just to verify it because I don't want to, you know, appear to be talking out of my rear end here. But it seemed to be like a good seven, eight yards difference between the quarterback and the nearest defender player. But the moment he went to go uh, hook slide, it, you could see the defensive players just, you know, you know, stop chasing the quarterback. And the moment that that happened, the quarterback just didn't slide and ran for a touchdown. So I mean, should we ban? hook slides should we ban fake slides i mean should we uh, because if we ban if we ban hook slides or if we ban fake uh, fake slides or anything like that it does open up a lot of can of worms in regards to you know uh intention to hit the quarterback as to when when does the when is the quarterback fair game from the moment that he decides to because there's there's a lot of opportunity to hit the quarterback, and if I go to hit you, and I'm about three four yards away, and I've already launched, it doesn't matter that you begin to you know when you decide. The fact is that when you hook slide, and because I'm you know three or four yards away and I hit you, I'm getting flagged. So right now there needs to be some kind of line here, but at your Twitter account was more so hey let's ban fake slides, but mm -hmm. we do need to have the conversation about hook sliding in general, don't we? And that's, and that's definitely why I wanted to bring it up because uh, I was traveling all day, so I listened to the game on the radio. And to me, hitting a quarterback when he's going, when he's giving himself up for the slide is not good. I didn't see the play, and in no way am I justifying what the Bomber player did. Again, because I didn't watch it, it would probably stick in my head better if I watched the play. The only reason this popped into my head as a possible hot take is just this morning they showed that highlight as the highlight of the night. No negative connotation. This was amazing. This was an amazing heads-up play to fake the slide and then run it for a touchdown. And no, this has not been a problem or a pandemic in the Canadian Football League of quarterbacks faking the slide. But the problem is it was the highlight of the night. This was promoted as an absolutely brilliant play. This was TSN's highlight of the night and i think just because that happened to happen this morning or at least seeing the highlight this morning and when i went to twitter to look for it it was nothing but praise for this brilliant play and that's the reason why i got thinking wait a minute that's actually pretty greasy 
because now you've actually taken an element of respect out of the football game. Those defensive players, out of respect, won't hit you if you show yourself giving up and going for the slide. And I'm not saying this is a problem in football, but it was enough when I saw that slide and then have a quarterback take a late late hit after a hook slide made me thinking, how much of a line was crossed there? Because there is an element of respect and disrespect towards the defense because they gave it to you. And then you stayed up and ran for the touchdown. So it, it was something, maybe not necessarily a problem, but it just brought me like, this just seems like something we should nip at the butt. And for me, I think it should be a full ban on fake hook sliding because you're talking about an element of respect in the game. There is an element, it should be, it wasn't shown today by the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, but for all intents and purposes, there should be an element of respect when a quarterback is going to sacrifice himself on a hook slide. So I think it's something, it, I think it's something that could be a conversation, nip it in the bud so we don't see it at the Canadian Football League. Because honestly, I don't, I can't off the top of my head think of a quarterback that fake hook slide and then stayed up and run. I'm just saying it's happened now. There's a precedence out there and everyone loved it and thought it was a great play. And to me, I don't know. I thought that was, there wasn't enough conversation on how disrespectful that was to that team's defense and a, well, sports loves its unwritten rules. To me, it was almost a slap in the face to an unwritten rule that was meant to respect quarterbacks. And when you boast about how much you need to protect quarterbacks, you openly flaunt that respect for the position. I don't know. I saw it. I'm like, that's actually, that's super greasy. That is super greasy. And I don't think that should, it should definitely not be praised at the level it is. You can call it, you can talk about it, you can show it, but I think you should also not make it sound like it was a brilliant heads up play. And you know something. You know, you, you just mentioned it and confirmed that it's something that doesn't really happen too too often in the CFL. But one thing that kind of and and again, this is like a whole can of worms. But a receiver or running back going to on the sidelines, and because you don't want to get penalized, the defensive back or linebacker or what have you lays off, doesn't want to hit you, doesn't want to get another fifteen yards roughing you know roughing penalty. So because of that. The running back or receiver now has the opportunity to get a whole a whole yard or two, and possibly a first down, all because you don't want to give up that extra ten or fifteen yards in penalty. So, I stuff like that happens, and we we may see some some rule changes just just by something that happens in in college football. Uh, let's get to our third down hot take, and before we start uh, to reviewing the games that happened earlier today. And uh, <clears throat> this one has to do with one of the games that happened uh, via social media. I don't have the Twitter account handy, uh, but the a couple of Toronto Argonauts were were filmed going at it with the Hamilton Tiger Cats fans. Now there needs to be context because the video it it it, it starts so suddenly. It's not something that goes from the beginning of the situation to to the end. It just starts at a certain point. So I think there does need to be context. So by all means, are we putting a spotlight in a negative way on these two Argonaut, Argonaut players, but we do need to talk about it. And uh, the, uh, the players in general uh, are in question are Chris Edwards and I believe Curly Gittens Jr. And uh, this Hamilton Tiger Cat fan got the worst of it, obviously. And it looks like that there were some, some fluids tossed towards the Argonaut players uh, based on some Twitter commentary, and again, this is all speculation because, you know, it's it. You know, we can't go based off of what someone on Twitter says all the time. But this this video just proves that, hey, listen, maybe maybe stay away from the from the the opposing team or at least the the team on the losing end. Maybe maybe there should have been security to to allow because this looked like it would happen near football field level. This isn't a player going up to the stands. And then high fiving a lot of people, and then just shit canning or you know get, kicking the crap out of a, a fan. This was on field level, so there there needs to be something done on a security level. You got you had a little chance to take a look at it because this what this was not talked on Sports Center. This was sold through social media. Your thoughts on this one? 
Yeah, from what I see, this is one of those things that you've got to be very careful. I can't make any claims based on what I saw. My brain will just fill in. I mean, anything else before and after, I would fill in. But, I mean, what I can deduce from it, what I see on that, again, you've got a fan down in the player's area. As you can see, the exit with the Argonauts sign where the Argonauts must come and leave to go to their locker room, and you've got a Tiger Cats fan completely decked out in Tiger Cats gear. And, I mean, the vid- the qu- what's questionable is the video starts with the Argonauts throwing the player, throwing the punches, which is, to me, questionable right out of the gate because we don't know what started it. And I've had interactions with football players at McMahon Stadium when I was in my 20s and we'd go to games, and I've had my interactions with football fans. And no matter anything I've said, I never had a player come after me in the stands to kick my ass. So if that if that fan is down there and a player is going after you, I do not think that that fan was standing on the sideline saying, listen, sorry, guys, you played a great game. There's got to be a loser. Unfortunately, it was you this time. But, you know, chin up, and hopefully we'll see you in the East Final again next season. I will, even though I wasn't there, I will bet dollars to donuts that was not what the fan was saying to that Argonauts player. And whatever he said, I mean, if he had a, too much liquid courage in him, chances are it was pretty ignorant if a player would go out and you just beat them at home. I don't know. I, the The Canadian thing to do will be to bash the league, bash the Argonauts, bash BMO Field, bash the image of the Canadian Football League because a player took a swung at the at a fan. But I think the reasonable thing is I will sit on this one and see that fan's going to sing like a bird when the media gets a microphone in front of him because he'll milk, milk his 15 minutes of fame. And the player will say his piece. And in this case... I'm willing to bet that that was just not a player walking by saying, are you a Tiger Cats fan? Yeah, and then rabbit punching him in the throat. (laughs) I'm going to say that is not what happened, even though I wasn't there. Yeah, and uh, and unfortunately, because, you know, the the fan in question is not named, we obviously know the two Argonaut players in question. Chances are, regardless if it was right or you know he's innocent chances are he's going to be fined immensely because uh that can't happen you know yeah i hope he enjoys his last game at bmo field because he'll never yeah. go back <laughs> yeah exactly uh, let's go let's start to reviewing the the two divisional finals game we started talking about the the hamilton tiger cats as well as the toronto argonauts the hamilton tiger cats uh they came back. This is a comeback. The, the Toronto Argonauts were ahead 12 nothing at one point. And Hamilton comes ahead with, uh, well, they were 12-6 and then 13-6. And then they, they traded a quarter, the field goals for touchdowns. And Toronto found out that, holy crap, we actually need to score touchdowns because Hamilton scored four of them. And uh, they ended up winning 27-19 in BMO Field. Uh, your thoughts on the game? Uh, as, from what you watched. Yeah, and from what I saw, clearly Dane Evans played like Dane Evans from the Eastern final last year because he was he clearly came in, gave them momentum swing, and uh, this was just your classic cliche of a game of two halves. Hamilton couldn't get it together in that first half, and honestly, with the field goals at the time, did not seem like they were going to hurt the Argonauts. Yes, obviously you want to get touchdowns, but with the way the Tiger Cats were playing, not being able to move the ball, Toronto's defense looked great. And if anything, it looked like the next team that was going to get a touchdown was the Argonauts. So to me at the time, you know, not taking into that whole, oh, it's the CFL, no lead is safe consideration, the Tiger Cats are watching points go on the board. And to me in the East Final, it's one of those things like, well, you've got to have you got to go for the, the the touchdown if you're close enough. It's like, this is the East Final. Hamilton's watching Poor points go on the board. That's going to, to me, that's a more psychological attack than going for it on third down, not getting the touchdown, and then throwing all the momentum to the Hamilton Tiger Cats. It was one of the arguments I made last week with the Stampeders and the 
riders was that Dave Dickinson screwed up on two occasions. One of the biggest ones in the first half when he went for it on a third down after they were just manhandling the, well, manhandling is probably a bit much, but they had the momentum and then gave it all back to the riders with a third down stop. And to me, doing that in the Argonauts game would have been a bad decision. And turns out, I mean, the Tiger Cats just made their amendments. What is, what's the word I'm looking for? Their, their changes at the halftime. And they came out a brand new football game with a brand new quarterback. And, you know, they got business done. So, I mean, good for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. I didn't think they had it in them to come back. I thought Toronto we just had a lot of momentum, a lot of good things going their way, even without the touchdowns. They were still getting down the field and putting foot points on the board so i i was genuinely surprised that the tiger cats came back and wanted even all even with the whole no lead is safe thing in the canadian football league yeah and 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 i, and I get what you mean by the you know you don't <laughs> think that the field goals are or the the lack of touchdowns was going to hurt the argonauts um defensively hamilton was actually pretty decent so they they needed their offense to get in the gear and it, like I, I, I posted from the, the Rouge Radio Twitter account, I thought it was going to be like which defensive lineman was going to have a bigger game and between the Tiger Cats, Ja'Gary Davis, or was it Coney Ely from, from the Argonauts? And as good of a game as Ely had, Ja'Gary Davis just had that much of a better... He had a, like a huge impact on that game that whatever momentum they that Toronto had... Jagger Davis just did, they they just happened to take it away, and I think that offensively they they found their groove. They got to, they they replaced Mazzoli with Dane Evans, sixteen for sixteen, couple of touchdowns, and once they made that change, you could just see you know you know everything moving smoothly for the Tiger Cats. And I mean it wasn't it wasn't uh, in a piece of artwork, but. It was a lot better than what uh, what Jeremiah Mazzoli was going through in the first quarter or first quarter in a bit, and you know as soon as that momentum, as soon as Hamilton took that league, that lead, uh, you could just sense that it was over for Toronto. They just couldn't do anything offensively, even defensively. You know they were holding their own, but it wasn't what it was in the first half. And special teams, I, I remember just listening back to the game, and I remember thinking, okay. Whoever's going to have the better, the better special teams? Boris Beattie misses misses a field goal when he was been almost perfect, and I thought it was just going to be it was going to end on his foot alone. But you know because uh, they got Poppy White with a return, I can't remember the amount of yards that they had, but because they had, they they got that special teams trick, you know, you know it's it's a facet of the game, and I think that they got they got you know some great work out of all three facets, whereas Toronto. I don't want to say that all three facets were bad. They just weren't as consistent as they needed to be. And I think that's exactly why Hamilton was able to pull it out. Uh, the Western final was a completely different story. Uh, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers win th uh, 21 to 17. I think everybody was wrong as we thought that this was going to be a, not a blowout, but maybe the uh, the score flattened, the flattered the Riders almost, or maybe even flattered the Bombers. Six turnovers for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and I think the Saskatchewan Rough Riders only managed 10 points off of those six turnovers that in itself if you commit six turnovers throughout a whole game in a playoff game you you should be winning or leading the entire game no if ands or buts and you should be shutting the door the rest of the way and I think that speaks volumes for what we thought of the Saskatchewan offense this is a team that has some okay players, but you know, from from the offensive line to the lack of receiver help the all season, it finally came to fruition this one game. As close as they made it, I think this speaks volumes about how maybe maybe the Saskatchewan Rough Riders weren't up to par with matching wits for wits or pound for pound with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. But on the other hand, Winnipeg, I mean, you said, what's it going to take for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to lose a game? And you said, well, they're going to have to shoot themselves in the foot or the weather's going to become the, the great equalizer. The weather was, uh, I don't think the weather was an issue today, but man, did they try their best to shoot themselves in the foot, don't you think? Oh, yeah, it was just, I I was I had to listen on the radio, but it was, I, 
I even couldn't believe what was happening listening to it, much less what it would been like to see it. And, <coughs> and, and how bad – see, I shouldn't have been worried from the, from the, from the beginning – because the writer, uh, the writers had those two turnovers, and and I don't want to say that they, all of them were forced. I think the Nick none Dembski of them were won- two of the six. Two were actually forced by the writers. Yeah, because and I'll say when three. I, when I watched, I'll... no, when I when I watched the highlights, uh, <laughs> Dembski just barfed up the ball, and mm. that there was no problem there. I'll give them the fumble on the two, and that they ran back because it was a strip. Uh, one of the interceptions was a rush, but it was a bad decision. He should have eaten it. It wasn't it, it, the the Riders didn't force the first pick. The second pick went straight to a Riders player without going to anybody else. And then yeah, there was a legit strip. But I mean, three of the six turn like two actually two. Well, I forget the lot. I'm, I'm missing one. I can't remember what it is. There was the Dembski one, the one of the two. Two interceptions, oh, and, and then the, the fumble at the end of the game, or at the end of the ha- first half. They had the uh, the the turnover on downs, which Mike O'Shea. Oh yeah, and that was a turnover at down. Yeah, and Mike O'Shea said that the Riders had too many men, which was missed, or I don't know if it was missed or what and, have you. And yeah, and uh, that was Winnipeg's fault as well because mm-hmm. uh, the kicker was w- the way they explained it on the radio. It looked like there may have been a fake, but he didn't understand what the call was coming in. And he just effed it up. He just screwed up because he wasn't sure if they were calling for a fake. So they snapped it and he ran, you know, like based on what Doug Brown and Bob Irving were saying is that that turnover on the on the the blown field goal or whatever, the blown punt was just was was Winnipeg's fault. Like they didn't it's not like they made a third down stand. Like, I mean, here's the thing. It's like you started by saying it wasn't a blown out. Like, it was a blowout. That football game was a blowout. Saskatchewan was useless in that football game. I, I, I like – a week ago I tried to say that it's disrespectful to use the they didn't beat us, we beat ourselves. Like I don't like that. You have to give them some respect. But this football game, like even listening to it, you never even have to talk about the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. They literally just had to stand there and wait for Winnipeg to screw up. The numbers were just gross. The numbers were gross. They had like three times, like Ottawa's net or Winnipeg's net yards was like three times Saskatchewan's at one point. It was a blowout. Winnipeg just didn't finish. Like that was a lopsided, close football game. Like I don't even know how to explain it. Because again, like I said, to me, only two of the turnovers were actually Saskatchewan players doing something. Everything else was just Winnipeg being stupid. Like I, I don't think you even go through, you've got turnover and you only have 10 points to show for it like that's ridiculous six turnovers in 30 minutes of football you have no offensive stats your running back isn't doing any your receivers aren't doing anything like winnipeg was completely or sorry saskatchewan was completely irrelevant to that first half of football it was just winnipeg screwing up and then having to save their own ass because as soon as they screwed up The defense just went in and fixed it for them. Like Saskatchewan, as much as you want to say Winnipeg, Saskatchewan didn't beat, if if it came to that, Saskatchewan didn't beat Winnipeg, Winnipeg. Literally, Saskatchewan did nothing in that football game. The second half looked interesting because Winnipeg screwed up so much in the first half. Like that was a blowout. Winnipeg or Saskatchewan did nothing in that football game. Even like one touchdown after the after the mess in the first half, they still only put together what was the final score? Seventeen or twenty one seventeen? Twenty one seventeen, yeah. Yeah, they, all they did was put another. It was a good. Don't get me wrong. They answered a Winnipeg touchdown with a touchdown, but that was it. Like this reminded me of the Argos Grey Cup win over Calgary. Calgary absolutely dominated every facet of the game. It was just the Calgary Stampeder show, but they screwed up twice and it cost them. And this was the same thing with Winnipeg. Saskatchewan did not look like it belonged on the same field with them. Saskatchewan was not stopping Winnipeg from succeeding. Like in the first five minutes, 10 minutes, that should have been a 21-0 football game. Like that's how much Winnipeg blew them out. And Saskatchewan did nothing to stop Winnipeg at all. It was Winnipeg stopping Winnipeg. 
and as, as again as disrespectful to Saskatchewan as that sound, that's what it was. It was Winnipeg's offense going out, screwing itself over, and then Winnipeg's defense going out and dominating Saskatchewan. And then Saskatchewan would kick it back, and Winnipeg would go out, put together a nice job, and f something up. So then the defense would come out and fix it and just stone Saskatchewan. Like it didn't matter. Saskatchewan was irrelevant to this football game because it was all about what Winnipeg was screwing up and then having to fix. That's the best way. I can, I'm sorry, Saskatchewan. This isn't personal, but you literally had no impact on the football game today. This was not about you. You did nothing this afternoon. This is this was a blowout in every term of the blowout. Winnipeg just screwed up the blowout. Yeah, the, the, the first thing here is it very well could have been Winnipeg 14 nothing after the first two drives. And after a couple of turnovers, it was 7 7. Like, like legit. Like, that, <laughs> like you, you tell me that there's a, there's a 14 point swing and you have all these turnovers and you're tied after a couple of. Yeah, that, uh, like, I don't want to say Winnipeg was dominating, but at the same they time, it was like, were. yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in retrospect, defensive. I mean, I thought you said what would you said was like is probably the best to describe it is the Winnipeg offensively. Yeah, they put together a couple of here, a couple of good drives here, and then they cough it up, and then they're, defensively they just said, okay, you know what, let's just try again. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's what it was. And I remember thinking to myself going into the halftime, I'm like. I'm going to have to debunk Tony's theory of we they didn't beat us we're beating ourselves because that's legit what it looked like because there was, was nothing yeah. there was nothing Saskatchewan was doing and yeah they made it close but I I think it more so flattered and why are we not giving the ball to William Powell more like I, I'm not saying it would have had any like any more success for it but come on like. You saw that Andrew Harris had 130 yards rushing on the ground. William Powell, I don't even know what he had, but he was, you know, he, he had some yards in in the third or fourth quarter. There he goes. Rushing yards, 11 carries, 32 yards for a 2.9. He, he man, Saskatchewan, option one going into the offseason is Saskatchewan's got to go out and somehow get a a couple of good offensive linemen. Because if they have the same offensive weapons going into 2022, they might be able to do something. But until they do, I'm not taking Saskatchewan seriously uh, going into the next year. But that's next year. Let's talk this year because there is one game left. And it's the 108th Grey Cup in Hamilton. The Hamilton Tiger Cats host the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Their one and only meeting that they had was in week one, August 5th. The Bombers won that one, 19-6. Uh, raising their Grey Cup banner. This is a story that is kind of like almost flipped from when these two teams met. And and I want to, I because I, I don't want to say that tw- uh, the 2019 Grey Cup win by Winnipeg was a fluke because Winnipeg was a very good team going into that game. What I was surprised is how they won it. They won by 21 points. And I... If you would have said that Winnipeg's going to win that game, I would have said, okay, maybe within seven or eight points, maybe. But they they were dominating from the from from the opening kickoff. This year, it's like the reverse. Ha- Winnipeg's got all the all stars. Their chances are they're going to win. Uh, you know, they're going to sweep the the awards just like Hamilton did that year. They've got the coach of the year pending, obviously, the awards next week. Do you think Hamilton has enough horses to pull off this? And I'm not even going to say if they do win that it's going to be an upset, but do you think that they have the horses to pull off this win to end the 22-year longest active Grey Cup drought, Tony? Well, I think the difference... To me, the big difference is Winnipeg did it like quarterback committee. They had Nichols and then a string of Strevler and then... An unknown wild card in Zach Caleros came in. So we weren't on the same wave with Winnipeg yet because we weren't sure what Zach Caleros was going to be. At the time, he was just a fun story and a comeback story. So we were enjoying it, but we weren't sure what that uncertainty at quarterback was going to be. 
against the solid, clear, Dane Evans-led Hamilton Tiger Cats. So for me, it wasn't necessary that we thought Winnipeg was bad and Hamilton was good. It was To me, it was more like, can Zach Kalaros keep doing this? And now after a season of absolute dominance, we saw that Zach Kalaros could do this. So to me, this gets a little bit worse if you're the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Um, you still got a good football there in football team in Hamilton. They'll be at home. We're in December now, mid-December when the game happens. Weather is going to be an influence. I'm, I don't know what weather's calling for right now, but don't rule out a complete whiteout out Allen 1996 in Hamilton. Like, and honestly, that would just be absolute amazing if it was that kind of snowy, all bets off Grey Cup. So I think going into this football game, I don't know if you want a straight out prediction right now and a score, but going into the football game and knowing how much more confident, more established, even more put together with veterans, veterans who know how to win, veterans who know how to play, veterans who've been there, and veterans who are the reigning Grey Cup champions against the Tiger Cats team that's got 21 years of pressure on their back and the pressure of being at home to end it. I don't know how much that home field can help you against pure talent. And for me, it's just today you witnessed the shittiest Winnipeg Blue Bomber team we've seen, what, would you say three years? We haven't seen a Winnipeg Blue Bomber team that absolute shitty and won the football game. Last week we said a quarterback shouldn't throw, what was it, four INTs and win. They got six turnovers and a half and won. Like, we just saw a, a gross, an absolute gross Winnipeg Blue Bombers team still dominate and still win. And I can't, as much as I would love to be able to give you the Cinderella, the drought is over prediction for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, I just can't. If weather can come in and slow Winnipeg down, that's great. Let's have an exciting great cup. I just don't think Hamilton isn't better than the Hamilton team that lost to this Bombers team last year. That's clearly better. And for me, that's a win for the Blue Bombers. That I, For me, I'm giving back-to-back championships to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And that's something that hasn't happened <laughs> since 2009 and 2010 when the Montreal Alouettes did it against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Sorry, Rider fans who are listening because right now the 13th man is now in the forefront of your memory right now. Um, Although when the last I, time the Argonaut, the last time the Tiger Cats played in back-to-back great cups, would have been what, 98, 99 when they split with the Stampeders? Mm-hmm, yeah. So uh, who knows? It, I mean, yeah, it, it's, I, I'm not, I'm not as confident as you are, but first off, let, let's talk about a storybook ending here. Zach Kalaros, who, when he was traded to Winnipeg two years ago, it was a, oh, can Zach stay healthy? And obviously with the, you know, the, the pandemic season, you know, obviously was healthy there. He started all meaningful games this year. The only games he did not start was after the Bombers had already clinched first in the West. And he was 17 of 21. And the only passes that he... Th- like, I-, I think he had one incompletion, and then the other ones were, were picked off. And one of them was because of Nick Dembski just kind of, you know, the tip drill. Like, like, like I, 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 I don't know if there is someone playing better football right now on offense this year so far than it is right now than Zach Kalaros because he's protecting the ball as much as he can and he's he's uh, he's uh, what's the word I'm looking for he's he's spreading the ball evenly as much as he can you know Rashid Bailey's coming to his own Kenny Lawler proved that he is a a number one guy Drew Olatarski is a guy that you can't forget Nick Dembski's still a guy that and then lo and behold there's Andrew Harris who's on the who's who can run the ball 130 yards a game if you give him enough carries. Defensively, and 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 I forgot to mention this. Guess what happened today? 
the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, just like anybody else, did not score a point in the fourth quarter against the mm-hmm. Winnipeg Blue Bombers defense. That is that is that is like if you're Hamilton, like okay, you can easily say okay, well we got fourth four four quarters to to get these points and then you know we end this drought. It might not be that you might only have three quarters. Like yeah. like this is this is scary. <laughs> now having said that. I'm not going to say that Hamilton was lucky to get out of Toronto. They played their way. They played very – it took them a while to get started, but they played pretty good football. Defensively, special teams came up to play. I mean, obviously, they got to sort out that kicking situation. Dane Evans looked uh, almost unstoppable. But right now, it's a different – it is a different – it's a opponent, a different opponent. Hamilton – it's a different opponent that Winnipeg is facing in, in Hamilton as opposed to week one and vice versa. There's a lot of players that were playing that weren't playing in week one that are going to be playing in this great cup. And then vice versa, there were players that that were playing in week one that aren't playing anymore. And and I think this 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 provides a little bit of a drama. There's nothing better. And like I said this a couple of weeks ago, and I said, hey, if the Bombers don't win the Great Cup, I would not mind if the Hamilton Tiger Cats would because of coach Orlando Steinhauer. Having said that, oh man, I want to agree with you, but there's just, I just have this feeling and I looked at the weather report. It is supposed to be a high of plus three with rainy showers of of rainy uh, snow showers. So we might have a slushy game come, uh, come five 30 central standard time or whatever the time is Eastern when the kickoff is. And I think we might not. We might have a different type of equalizer that may. It's not wind. It's not cold. It is freaking slush, baby. And I think Hamilton has the home field. I think Hamilton does end their Great Cup drought. I think Hamilton takes this one. I'm going to say 25-20 over the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. It is going to be a repeat of the 98-99 Great Cup Finals, where Hamilton loses in '98 and then wins in 1999. And yes, Hamilton, you might party like it's 1999. Just choose better music, okay? That'll wrap it up for episode 426 of the Rouge Radio Podcast. Tony, any final thoughts? No, just uh, enjoy what we're about to get. Uh, We're either going to get a back-to-back champion for the first time since the Montreal Alouettes, or the Tiger Cats are going to break 22 years of misery. So I think, I mean, obviously... Hamilton's the only one that's going to get the real worst out of this deal with 23 years without a great cup from a, but from a standpoint, you've got two good storylines going into the great cup game. It's a rematch again. We always say how hard it is to win back to back in labor day. Imagine how hard it is to win back to back when a national championship is on the line. So again, my final prediction, I, as much as I want to say a classic and, and a fun game. I am going to take Winnipeg 31-13 because I don't. Get, I didn't give a score. It's just we are just living in an age of Winnipeg Blue Bomber football right now, and you basically just have to sit there and let it happen until that team dismantles for whatever reason. Because I think Winnipeg Blue Bombers football is is going to rain again in 2021. And I tell you, if the Bombers do win the Grey Cup next week. You thought that I was insufferable for the past 660 <laughs> days. I will be – because, uh, l- listen, the Ryder fans made it a point to point out, even in re- in relevant conversations prior to 2019, they made it a point to say 1990, even in irrelevant conversations, like, hey, how's the weather, 1990? So I will make it a point to bring up the fact that if they win – Hell, I, I can still do it now. The fact that they've, you know, they've only won four great cups, and you know, the Bombers have won eleven. But again, that that's showing the immature side of me. But I, I might be the most insufferable person in 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 that covers the Canadian Football League. Well, that here's a more for... insufferable. Here's a more insufferable <laughs> stat: if the Bombers win, the the Winnipeg Blue Bombers have a chance to win. Half as many great cups in two seasons than the Riders have won in over a hundred years. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man! I, uh, I, they're there, almost there's... halfway to as many great cups as the Rough Riders in two seasons than the Rough Riders have accumulated in a hundred years. So, 
There you go. Uh, sorry, um, at Stadnik. You can blame <laughs> you could blame Tony for this one because that is You're something ride that, that I I am going to ride that should the Bombers win the Grey Cup next week. <laughs> That'll wrap it up for episode 426. Uh, for Tony, I'm Daltz. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Find more great shows like this at CF Pod Network on Twitter.